Today is Tecla Tech Talk, Episode 3. Hello, and welcome to C.S. Wilson Draws. I'm C.S. Wilson. In this Tech Talk, I'll remind everyone about the importance of backing up your data and show a couple of low-cost methods that I use. I'll also go over a few tips and techniques on how I handle curve parts both in the model and on the drawings. Once again, there's a lot to cover, and there's a lot of little extras along the way. We're going to go quick, so let's get to it. I'll start off by saying, backing up your data is important. I think we can all agree on that. When disaster strikes, programs can be reinstalled, device drivers can be re-downloaded, and probably updated while you're at it. And your browser history, well, maybe that should be cleared out. But the data. All that data you've worked so hard to create and spend so much time developing isn't so easily replaced. And that's why backing up your data is important. Now that the obvious has been overstated, I'll say that any level of backup is better than nothing, and no system is perfect. Even the simplest methods can reduce the amount of headaches that result from data failure or corruption. In my opinion, a successful backup plan comes down to two things, redundancy and transparency. And by that I mean make as many copies as possible and put them in as many different locations as possible, plus keep the user interaction down to an absolute minimum. So this isn't meant to be a complete guide on how to create your backup system, but I'll go over what I use and I'll put some links to more information in the video description below. If you don't already have a system in place or you're looking to change things up, this video and those links are a good place to start. What I use is nothing fancy or expensive, but I found it to be surprisingly effective. It starts with my data drive, which is actually two drives, in a RAID 1 or mirrored configuration. In a nutshell, both drives appear on the system as one drive, drive D in my case. And anytime I send something to that drive, it writes to both those drives simultaneously, essentially creating a backup in real time. You can usually set this up in BIOS, or if you have Windows 7 and up, you can use the disk management tool to set up a software RAID. Now, this won't protect you from a virus attack or accidentally deleting or overwriting data. I'll talk more about that later. But it does provide a reasonable amount of protection against hardware failure. If you hit a bad sector on one drive, or it just plain craps out and stops working, your data is safe and sound on the other drive. But what if both drives fail? That's where the next part comes in. And that's off-site storage, or cloud storage, or internet storage, or whatever you want to call it. But it's up there somewhere. I, I don't know where it goes. But it's not here, and that's what's important. I automatically sync my Tecla models and other critical data to Google Drive because it's 15 gigs of free storage, and it's reliable, and it works in the background, but mainly because it's free, and 15 gigs is more than enough for what I do. There's a variety of other internet storage servers with a wide variety of plans and options, and an even wider variety of prices. I use Google Drive in a single user situation, and it works pretty well. I don't think it would work well for a multi-user setup. Tecla has a model sharing service that would probably be better for that, but it's not as free. Also, I found Google Drive works best when I pause the syncing while I'm working in Tecla structures and then unpause it when I'm done and allow it to fully sync. There tends to be a lot of collisions if I don't and Google Drive will ultimately end up crashing. Pausing and unpausing is a minor annoyance and I've done it enough now that it's just second nature. It's not the most convenient, but the price is right. The last line of defense in my backup system is this an external USB hard drive. I use this along with Acronis True Image to make a clone of both my program and data drives. And fun fact, if you have a Western Digital Drive attached to your system, either internal or external, you can get Acronis True Image WD Edition for free. And yes, I'll put a link to it in the description below. Now, cloning isn't as current as real-time syncing because I only clone the drives periodically, usually once a month for the program drive and once a week for the data drive. It's really only meant for a catastrophic scenario, such as a virus attack or needing to retrieve some data that I wrote over or permanently deleted. Using all or even a couple of these methods I've talked about will greatly decrease the chances of data loss. But like I said before, anything is better than nothing, and no system is perfect. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about curved parts or rolled parts as they're known in the steel industry. And I'll show a few basic techniques I use to get an accurate layout in the model. Plus I'll throw in a couple of tips on how I prep and dimension the drawings for these parts. These won't necessarily be step-by-step -step instructions, but you can use the information you get here and apply it to your own project. In the example I'm using horizontally curved parts, but this also works for vertically curved parts as well. There's a couple of formulas involved, so you might want to get a pencil and paper. To start, I need to have some guidelines. So I'll go to Construction Objects and select a circle using the center point and radius. I've arbitrarily set the center and I'm using a radius of 15 feet for those playing at home. Next, I'll draw a construction line that goes from the center to a point outside the circle. There's a couple of different ways to model curved parts and they each have their own special little setup. I normally use a three-point poly beam and a special configuration file that controls where the length of the part gets calculated, but more on that later. So just so I have some place to snap to, I'll copy this guideline over five feet on either side. Then pull down the beam menu and select poly beam. And define the start, middle, and end points. Now select the part and double click on the middle node to bring up the chamfer properties and select the bull nose profile from the drop down list and click modify. Now when using a bull nose chamfer, the middle point doesn't have to be in the exact middle of the part. It can be anywhere as long as it falls somewhere along that curve. You can adjust the smoothness and roundness of a curve with a few advanced options. I'll show the settings I use, but you may have to tweak them a little if the geometry of the part starts to fail. Hop over to Advanced Settings and do a search in all categories for Polybeam. Set XS Polybeam Chord Tolerance to 1 and XS Polybeam Max Angle Between CS to 5. Then click Apply and OK, save your model, and restart Tecla Structures. When using a polybeam for curved parts, the length is determined by the settings in a special configuration file named Unfold Corners Ratios.inp. This is normally found in the system folder under your Tecla Structures version and environment. I'm using version 2016 with Windows 10, and mine is under C colon Program Data Tecla Structures 2016 Environments USIMP system. There it is. To make things easier, I copy this file to my firm folder location or just put it in the model folder. The stock settings are usually okay for this, but if you want to tweak it or add a new profile, I'll leave a link in the description that explains how to do that in exhaustive detail. So now I'll show how to accurately cut this part to size. To do so, I'm going to use this guideline in the middle since it comes from the center of the radius and extends past the part. Let's say I want this part to be exactly 6 feet long, say 3 feet on either side of the guideline. I want to rotate copy my guideline from the center of the circle. So to obtain the rotation, the formula is the length times 57.296 divided by the radius. Make sure that you use the same units for the length and the radius. For example, if you use feet for the length, use feet for the radius. If you use inches for the length, use inches for the radius. Millimeters for length, millimeters for radius. You get the idea. For this example, that'll be 3 times 57.296 divided by 15, which equals 11.4592. So now I select the guideline, right click, and select Copy Special, Rotate. Then set the origin to the center of the circle and then enter 11.4592 for the rotation angle. I want it to rotate counterclockwise, so positive number equals counterclockwise and negative number equals clockwise. Click Copy. And before you do anything else, put a minus in front of the rotation angle and click Copy again. Now I'll pick up the Fit Part In command and select the part. Then set the two points for the cutting plane along those guidelines. When I list out the part, I can see that it's now exactly 6 feet long. 
This can be double checked with another formula, which is 0 0.017453 times the angle times the radius. So measure the angle and the radius, then apply the formula, confirmed. Now, you don't have to use a fitting. You could use a part cut or a polygon cut or just move the endpoints. Based on the unfold corner ratios.inp file, the true length of this profile, which is a wide flange, is along its center line. Now let's have a quick look at some basic dimensions I use for curved parts on the drawings. When I create an assembly drawing for a beam, curved or otherwise, I usually get something like this. For curved parts, I want to see the top view, so I'll open the drawing properties, click on view, and turn the top view on. I then turn on the center line in the part properties. I usually need to rotate the view so that the endpoints are aligned on a horizontal plane. I use the extension Rotate Drawing View to do this. It can be found in the Tecla warehouse, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. It works pretty simple. Just select the view, click on the Start button, then pick two points you want to horizontally align. The basic dimensions start with connecting the two endpoints with a manually drawn line and then drawing another line from the midpoint of that up past the center line of the part. Making sure ortho mode is enabled, I then stretch the endpoint down a bit. Then I change the line styles of these. Phantom line for the cord and center line for the center. Next, I draw a dimension from the cord and label it. And then one tying down the center line. I need a dimension showing the rise, and since Tecla doesn't have an oblique dimension, I manually create my own using lines for the extensions and a double arrow line for the dimension. Then place a vertical dimension and change the properties of those lines to ghost. I can then move the dimension to the proper place and label it. If needed, I'll use a cover-up box to hide anything underneath it. I place a radial dimension, usually to the right side of the part, that goes to the center line of the part. You need to select three points for this and it's important to make sure that you select endpoints or boxed points. The dimension will appear on the middle picked point. I also note that this dimension goes to the center line. So that's just a brief overview on how I handle curve parts and Tecla structures. There's obviously much more to it, but these are just the basics and should be enough to get you started. Again, take the information I show here and apply it to your own project. Sometimes seeing how other people do things can inspire you to come up with your own ideas and techniques. So that's going to wrap up episode three of Tecla Tech Talk. I hope you found it informative, and if so, please give it a thumbs up. Also, if you have any questions about this episode, just leave them in the comment section below, and I'll try my best to answer. If you don't have any questions and just want to leave a comment, you can do that too. You can also contact me via social media using the links in the description below. And don't forget, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. I try to upload content as often as I can. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.